A long time ago, in the Dark Ages of the 5th century, a time where the Roman conquerors had been driven out of the United Kingdom, there was a land known as Britannia, a realm where people sought to rule themselves. But without any unifying leadership or any real government, the lands of Britannia soon descended into a mad bloodbath of battles between tribal war chiefs and pretty much anyone who dared to declare themselves as king. During these Dark Ages, many kingdoms were at war with one another, and so the country as a whole became plagued with strife and discord. It was a time where people were more concerned with scraping the barrel to feed themselves than making contemporary accounts, and so we don't have a factual basis of what exactly went on during these desperate times. What we do have though is Le Mort d'Arthur, a reworking and collection of tales by Sir Thomas Mallory, an English writer of the 15th century. Mallory took tales of both English and French origin of Arthur and compiled them into one giant book, a book that is now one of the best and most comprehensive anthologies of Arthurian legend today. It is the basis for which the following videos in this series will follow, and so I hope you enjoy the work conducted by both the original writers and the translations by Sir Thomas Mallory. In the beginning, we are told that Uther Pendragon eventually became the king of all England during these Dark Ages, and while there appeared to be dispute and reckoning amongst the feudal lords, dukes and other political players, Uther Pendragon was as close to a king as the realm had gotten since the leave of the Roman Empire. During this time, there was a duke in the land of Cornwall, known as the Duke of Tintagil, and he had warred against Uther Pendragon for a number of years, and done battle against his forces countless of times. Neither of these two men seemed to be able to get the better of the other, and so with this realisation, King Uther Pendragon summoned the Duke of Tintagel to a parley. The Duke adhered to these terms, and brought along his wife Igraine, a most fair and beautiful woman. Upon receiving them at his castle, Uther Pendragon found that he got on well with the Duke of Tintagel, and liked him, and his wife Igraine. In fact, he liked her a little too much. He made a pass at her and beseeched upon her to lay with him, despite her being married. Described as an honourable woman, Igraine declined the king and went to her husband the duke to tell him of what had happened. Dishonoured and disrespected, the Duke of Tintagil and his wife Igraine set off into the night and quietly left the kingdom of Uther Pendragon to return home. When Uther learned of this, he grew bitterly angry and summoned his court to track down the Duke of Tintagil and his wife, and to have them brought back to him. But upon receiving word of this, the Duke didn't back down and refused to return to Uther's kingdom. Even under the threat of war and a siege, the Duke refused Uther's demands. He began to make preparations for Uther's advancement on his land, and wound up building a large castle named Tintagil, and another castle named Terrabil. As he knew of Uther's lusting for his wife, the Duke sought to place her in Tintagil Castle so as to keep her safe, while he himself set up shop in Terrabil Castle, eagerly awaiting Uther's forces. Uther Pendragon didn't disappoint. He brought forth a huge host of an army and laid siege to the castle of Terrabil, where many were slain in the battles fought there. Frustrated that he could not penetrate neither the Duke's castle or his wife, <laughs> Uther fell sick. It was one of his most loyal and noble knights by the name Sir Ulfius, who attended the king and learned why he was suddenly plagued with an illness. Wishing to make the king feel better, Sir Ulfius sought out the wizard Merlin, whom he had found amongst a group of beggars. Sir Ulfius explained the condition of the king to Merlin, to which Merlin answered that if Uther Pendragon rewarded him and was sworn to him thereafter, he would give the king everything he desired. Sir Ulfius sees this as a pretty fair deal and promises the king's allegiance, believing that as Merlin was a legendary wizard, he could surely achieve the things he had said, and that by making Uther's desires come true, it would surely see the king in better health. Sir Ulfius and Merlin return to King Uther Pendragon, and there, Merlin reveals that which he wants in return for giving Uther what he desires. So besotted with the Lady Igraine, Uther Pendragon was willing to do all but anything, and lucky for him, 
Merlin only asked that after he slept with a grain and conceived a child, that child would be handed over to himself. Uther Pendragon, who probably had no want of a bastard child anyway, was all but happy to agree to these terms. And so, Merlin began to cast a spell by which he turned Uther Pendragon into the likeliness of the Duke of Tintagil, so that he became identical to him in every way. He also turned Sir Ulfius into a doppelganger of Sir Brastius, a loyal knight of the Duke, before turning himself into a doppelganger of Sir Jordan, yet another loyal knight of the Duke. In their disguises, they sneak their way from the siege and make their way to the castle of Tintagil, where the fair lady Igraine was in safe keeping. During this time though, the Duke of Tintagil is slain in battle. Uther Pendragon, Sir Orpheus and Merlin arrive at Tintagil Castle and are greeted by the unsuspecting Lady Igraine, who as Merlin promised, senses nothing amiss about the disguises. She leads who she thinks is her husband the Duke to her bedchambers and Uther Pendragon lays with her, not even a few hours after the real Duke had died. We are told that it is on this night that their child is conceived, the boy who would become known as Arthur. After doing the deed, Merlin and Sir Jordan warns Uther that they must be leaving and so they head off into the night and back to their own kingdom, leaving the Lady Igraine totally unaware that she'd kind of been raped. When she learns of her husband's death, she marvels over how he had appeared before her, let alone how they had sex. We are told that in a matter of time, Sir Orpheus is able to orchestrate a liaison between Uther and Igraine, and that he is instrumental in convincing the fair lady into marrying the king. This would have likely come about because of King Uther Pendragon wanting to go for round two, but now that Lady Igraine had no husband for Uther to transform into, he had no means to get into her bed. It would have also been likely that the Lady Igraine became lonely, and now left with the charge of the Duke's forces, she would need a strong spouse to manage them. Sir Ulfius, aka Wingman of the Year, was said to plant this seed in Lady Igraine's head, and was responsible for her warming up to the idea of becoming queen. After their marriage, King Uther Pendragon had the nerve to ask Igraine as to whose child she carries within her, despite knowing full well it belongs to him. Igraine is dismayed to tell him the answer, for she knows how absurd it will sound, but she recounts the strange and painfully confusing encounter, telling Uther that the man she'd lain with was every inch her husband as far as she could remember, but that it couldn't have been, because her husband was slain, and yet she was so certain he'd been with her. It is at this moment that Uther decides to wave his jazz hands in front of her and say, Surprise! It was me, lol! He proceeds to tell her he'd sought after Merlin, and how Merlin had turned him into the splitting image of her late husband. He tells her of how he falsely pretended to be her husband, only to get her into bed, and furthermore, how neither of them will even be able to keep the child growing inside of her, because he had already promised it to Merlin. Hearing of this, Queen Igraine is… actually okay with this entire revelation. In fact, the text tells us she made great joy when she knew who was the father of her child. You can totally see what the attitude towards women was during the 5th century, and you can also see how women were made to feel subservient and at the whims of their male counterparts. Although to be honest, I don't think any woman of any time period would take kindly to this sort of nonsense, but hey, clearly the original author thought differently. When the child is born, we don't get a protest nor even a mention of how Igraine feels about her child being taken away. It simply just happens. Merlin appears before Uther Pendragon once more and reminds him of his promise, to which Uther is quick to pass off his newborn son into the arms of the wizard. We are told that under Merlin's orders, two knights take the child moments after it is born. They wrap him up in a bundle of gold and hastily deliver the baby to Merlin who then takes the boy to a lord named Sir Ector. It is Sir Ector and his wife who see to the raising of the boy who would become King Arthur. Two years later and Uther Pendragon falls sick again, and many feudal lords and self-proclaimed kings take advantage of his disposition. Many of his forces are destroyed, 
and many of his men are killed in battles, as he becomes utterly usurped. Merlin advises the king in his ill state not to remain in the comfort of his bed, but to ride into battle along with a great host. It was at the land of St. Albans where Uther Pendragon and his host clashed with the forces of the north, and that Sir Ulfius and Sir Brastius demonstrated a many valiant deeds, turning the tide of the battle in favour of the king. When the king returned to London from the victorious bout, he fell deeper into sickness. He lost his voice, he became bedridden, and soon not even Merlin could ease his pain. In his dying moments, Uther told Merlin and his court that by the grace of God, he passes on his kingship to that of his son Arthur. Of course though, things wouldn't be that simple. In the next video, we'll be taking a look at the sort of life the boy Arthur lived with his guardian Sir Ector and his surrogate brother, Sir Kay, as well as how he was recognised as king by pulling the sword from the stone. Let me know what you thought about this first episode in a very, very long series about the life of King Arthur and Arthurian legend. As always, if you've enjoyed today's video, then don't forget to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. Till the next time guys.